Well, we come now to 1 Samuel and 17. We read it a little bit earlier, all 58 verses of it. And I'm sure we're all familiar with it, if not from our earliest days. But I want this morning uh, to ask the Lord to bring something fresh from it that will speak into our own lives at the moment. So let's pray. Our Father God, we do thank you for your word, alive and active that it is. And pray this morning that your spirit will uh, plant it deep in our hearts, that we might by it grow in confidence in you, our Lord and our God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, one of the difficulties it always seems to me that we Christians can wrestle with is the tension that arises when what we say we believe doesn't seem to match up with what's happening in our lives. And one of the areas where I feel that tension is most keenly felt is that of the Holy Spirit. Uh, one factor that contributes to this is that we tend to forget that the Spirit in us, while an action on God's part, of course it is, he comes and lives within us, uh, must nevertheless be appropriated by faith, by us, if we are to benefit from it. Now today I want us to observe how David lives by faith, and by faith in the fact that the Holy Spirit is with him. Uh, first notice or recall David's anointing by the Spirit in the previous chapter. I'm simply recalling for us what we saw happen then just a few weeks ago. In 1 Samuel 16, Samuel's told by the Lord uh, that he has chosen David to be king. And he's told further, Samuel, that he is to fill his horn with oil and to be on his way to anoint the one that the Lord tells him to. Now, in Old Testament imagery, oil in these contexts, as we saw not that long ago, represents the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who David uh, was anointed with, and not just oil. And so, verse 13 of the previous chapter, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. Now, I recall sharing that in the Old Testament, the Spirit was given to a selected few. But there were promises. Of course there were. And Joel chapter 2 um, has one of them. In the last days, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. And your sons and daughters will prophesy, even on your servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. And so, as I'm sure you know, in Peter's first sermon, he preaches, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so the promise we're told there is for you and your children and all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now, of course, that's for you and I today, living in Scotland or wherever we're found on planet Earth. Those that receive the Lord Jesus Christ receive because of his death the forgiveness of their sins and because of his ascension into the uh, place of the Father's presence, the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out. And this is true for you and I today as it was even for those selected few in the past. Now, here's the question. What difference should having the Spirit of God make to David if the Spirit is in him? What difference should that Spirit make to David's life? In what way is he different from those around him who weren't anointed? Now, I've chosen David's first challenge after receiving the Spirit, and that is the battle with Goliath, to explore the difference that having the Holy Spirit made to David and can make for you and I today. So we're going to notice a few points together and then unwrap them and see what it is the Lord may be saying to us. Notice, first of all, having the Spirit meant David began in a different place. When David arrived at the Israelite camp, he found the Israelites 
beginning each day preoccupied with the problem before them. Notice the writer focuses on the visual spectacle of Goliath there in the near distance. It's in verses 4 to 7. Goliath came out of the Philistine camp, we're told. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet. He wore a coat of scale weighing 5,000 shekels and on his leg bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back and his spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. Now that's just the end. That's just the end of that shaft that David was carrying. Uh, 600 shekels, which is 15 pounds. So imagine the weight, sorry, that Goliath was carrying. And his shield bearer went ahead of him. Now, is it any wonder that Saul and his men were dismayed and terrified? And verse 24, we read, they ran in fear. Uh, only one man, and here's my point, only one man begins in a different place, and that's David. He asks, who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, can we see the difference? God, and not Goliath, is what preoccupies David. The Israelite fixation with the problem brought fear, and then, as we saw, flight with it. They ran in fear. But David's preoccupation is with God, and that gives him confidence. And this is what it means to live in the Spirit. It's to begin in a different place. The Spirit, if you recall, is the personal presence of God. And so in Ezekiel 37, we're promised a, a new day by the prophet when my dwelling place will be with my people. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now, the full realization of this, of course, is in glory. But meanwhile, the church and the Christian, because of uh, Pentecost, and because of each Christian's personal Pentecost in receiving the Spirit, we are told uh, by the Apostle, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? And this was true for David. And so he begins in a different place. It's also true for us. And we too should begin in a different place. Whatever challenges uh, we face at the moment, and we're all facing challenges of one sort or another, they mustn't be allowed to fill our field of vision. That's what Israel did. But David, with the Holy Spirit in his heart, began quite deliberately in another place with God present. And so must we. And it's here that faith must, as it were, flex its muscle and appropriate the truth of God's presence with us, with you and with I, ordinary Christians that we are, yet nevertheless believing and trusting in the living, reigning Christ. We are those who, like David, have that very same presence of God with us and spirit of God in us. So here's how we are to begin, not only every new day, but when faced with every new Goliath. You see, the spirit meant for David, and surely it must mean for you and I that we begin in a different place. Now, moving on, in the second place, having the spirit meant that David knew that the battle was the Lord's. He knew that the battle was the Lord's. When David is brought before King Saul, Saul protests that David is only a boy compared with Goliath, who, has, who, ha, who was a trained fighting man. But David, in verses 34 to 36, starts, it appears, uh, to celebrate his own achievements. 
He, he rescued sheep, he says, by pulling them from the mouths of bears and lions. And then he killed the bears and lions. But what David is actually doing only becomes clear in verse 37 when he says, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And the same is in verse 47. The conclusion of this contest will show that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, as David says, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Now, this is extraordinary. This is David's way of saying, it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. The battle is the Lord's. If we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we have the power of God available to us. And this again is the whole point of Pentecost. Jesus told the disciples to remain in Jerusalem. Why? Until they receive power from on high. And Paul tells us that the power we receive is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Now, do we proceed in the face of each day's battles, reminding ourselves that these battles are the Lord's? Do we get up and honestly confess that our efforts trying to solve these problems have maybe advanced things very little. Maybe we've even made some situations even worse, certainly left ourselves feeling worse. And anyway, it's not by my might nor by my power that this problem is solved, but by God's Spirit. David says it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. And why? Because the battle is the Lord's. You know, one of my favourite verses in Exodus is uh, chapter 14 and verse 14. It's when Israel are escaping Egypt and they turn near to the Red Sea and they notice Pharaoh and the Egyptians gaining on them. And what do they do? Well, they, of course, complain to Moses. And they say, was it because there weren't enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out into the desert to die? And listen to what Moses said. Moses answered, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. And the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. And then he says, you need only to be still. Now, isn't that just the most wonderful verse? And so this passage begins with David being filled with the Spirit, starting in a different place. And then secondly, coming to understand and act upon the truth that the battle is the Lord's. <laughs> it is not by human might, nor by human power, but by the Lord's spirit that these things the Lord calls us to and, and to face as challenges will be resolved. How wonderful. Listen to the verse again. Do not be afraid. I feel this must be a verse that's surely speaking to some of us, and certainly myself. Do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, says Moses, you will never see again. And why? Because the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now there's faith appropriating the presence of God with us and the Spirit of God in us. What a call and what an encouragement. And that verse is Exodus 14, 14. And if you feel at all like I do, you'll want to memorize that and take it to heart and, and, and pray in line with it that the Lord will make these things clear to us and strengthen us as we uh, lay the weight of our need upon his strength, even in our felt weakness. But moving on, having the Spirit meant that David displayed an active trust 
We see it in verses 38 to 47. You see, the first thing Saul does, having been persuaded by David that God will deliver him, is start dressing him in a soldier's armour. Now, two facts make this spectacle, I feel, almost amusing. First, David's not used to armour. He was probably suffocating under the weight of it. I think I would have been. And secondly, David has no experience of fighting battles in this professional military way. This isn't David. But the real point, the spiritual point here, I believe, is that it smacks of trusting in man's way of doing things rather than God's way of doing things. And so what does David do? Well, he discards the armour. He, he, he puts man's way aside, we might say, and he relies on how God has worked through him in the past. He looks to see how it is he's known the presence of God with him and at work successfully through him. And so what does he do? He picks up his staff, he collects five stones from the stream, and packs his sling. Now, these are what God has been pleased to bless before. And so by doing things this way, David is entrusting himself to God. This is active trust. This is looking to the past, seeing how God has been faithful previously to us, and depending on that same God, with expectation in the present, watching for him to act and to work. And what do we hear? Well, we hear him once again affirm who will give him the victory. He says, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. He's facing up the problem. He's facing up Goliath. And he's saying, look at you, you come against me in all these different professional um, attire as, as a soldier. Um, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel. Now, David here displays an act of trust. How hard, surely we all find this. How hard Saul goes on to find it. We're not quite left soul behind yet, but in 1 and 2 Samuel, as I read ahead and prepare for our studies, I've noticed that 1 and 2 Samuel are effectively a comparative study between Saul and David. And Saul loses his kingship, but David becomes, of course, Israel's greatest king. But time after time, in difficult situations, what we discover is that Saul relies upon his own wit and his own wisdom. Saul takes things into his own hands. David, however, on the other hand, waits upon the Lord in prayer. He looks to the Lord and stands firm. And in doing so, invariably sees the Lord fight for him and fight for Israel. And so he displays an active trust. And so too, you and I, as we face the challenges that confront us, even at this very moment, are called to display an act of trust, not in ourselves and our own strength and our own wit and imagined wisdom, but in the same God that David trusted in. And, 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 and knowing that the same spirit, the very presence of God that was in David is present within us because we too are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And this act of trust is really the only response to knowing that God is with us and for us in Jesus. So what a challenge. But moving on, the next point, the Spirit meant David got the victory, but he gave God the glory. And how important it is to see that. It's in verse 50. In verse 50, we read, So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. This is one of those concluding verses often found in the scriptures 
when some great achievement is being recorded. Uh, what it doesn't say is much more important than what it does. First and most obvious, it tells us of David's success. It says David triumphed over the Philistine. But the writer is saying far more than this. How did David triumph? It was with a sling and a stone and without a sword. The writer is really saying David triumphed, but not by human means, but divine means. He was successful, as we read in, in verse 14 of chapter 18, because the Lord was with him. This is the writer giving God the glory. And this is always the outcome uh, when God has been at work in our lives. Um, now, how can I say that? Because the chief end of man and woman is to glorify God. That's what God has always been doing in the world, glorifying himself. And he did it first in creation, as the heavens and the earth declared his glory at the beginning and do so today. Then he <clears throat> did it in the calling and the saving of Israel, a people who would glorify his name on all the earth. And then he did it in the coming of his son, that men might see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, how, now how he does it in the salvation uh, for those for whom Christ died is wonderful. Their deliverances are to the praise of his glory or to the praise of the glory of his grace. This is what we are self-consciously doing as we worship, ascribing glory to God. This is what the Christian life uh, brings us ultimately to. This is what led Martin Lloyd-Jones to conclude that all theology, when properly understood, becomes doxology. And doxology, of course, is praise. Now, David got the victory. Of course he did. As every child will tell you that has spent any time on these ancient biblical stories, David got the victory, but gave God the glory. In fact, all his psalms, if we think about it, are to the praise of the glory of his God. They're personal invitations by him to you and I to glorify the Lord with me, he says, and let us exalt his name together. And the child of God uh, begins in a different place and, as we can now see, finishes in a different place too. We did begin in a different place. All that have the Holy Spirit begin in this different place uh, and so did David, because the Spirit or the presence of God was with him. But then having the Spirit meant that he knew the battle was the Lord's and not merely his own. And knowing that the battle was the Lord's, what does he do? He displays an active trust. He parts with all the paraphernalia that a professional warrior would wear and soldier would wear and turns to what he has found the Lord faithful in in his past and actively trusts him in the present. And then, of course, having got the victory, what does he do? He gives God the glory. And this is what you and I surely are called to. And this is what 1 Samuel 17, it seems to me, is surely all about. This is David having been anointed, uh, seeking to uh, carry out the will of the Lord in the strength of the Lord and in the Spirit's power and recognising that while the rest of Israel, unwilling to demonstrate an act of trust in God uh, and therefore were fearful and took to flight, David begins by recognising that the true and living God is the one who is with him and is also with you and I. Uh, 
and how wonderful a thing that is. And so whatever it is that we're struggling with at the moment, whatever challenges are facing us from the world or the flesh or the devil, whatever circumstances we feel are, are certain to bring us to our knees and we wonder how we will get by or get through, then we are called by this passage and the spectacle not of Goliath, but the spectacle of David, indwelt by the Spirit, actively trusting that the presence of God was with him. We too in our day can display and exercise that same act of trust and know the Lord with us at every turn. All we really are invited to do, if I can find that wonderful verse in Exodus 14:14 14, 14 again. Remember, the Israelites are looking back they have the uh, river or the sea in front of them. They see the Egyptians gaining on them. All seems lost. And what does Moses say? Do not be afraid. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. What a challenge and what a beautiful promise. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for these words. <clears throat> we pray that by your spirit, we may enable to trust you as the one who fights for us and know that we need only to be still and know that you are God. Grant us, Lord, we pray, that peace in believing. We ask it all in Jesus' name and for his glory's sake. Amen. Amen.